こんにちは。今日アセンブリ言語について話します。けど、まず簡単な自己紹介をします。子供の頃からプログラマーでした。この写真には5歳でした。あの、電気工学も好きです。あの、大学で電気工学を勉強しました。2005年に高校プ,ラプログラミングを始めました。今、仕事は iOS を教えることです。ラ、uh, ンダスクールという学校で働いています。好きな趣味はレトロ,レトロパソコンを集めることです。ほとんどにアップルものですけど、uh, いろいろ他のパソコンもあります。じゃあ、15年前に日本に住んでいました。日本が日本が大好きです。日本語があんまり上手ではありませんので、今から英語でプレゼンテーションします。お願いします。<笑> so let's talk about assembly.、Uh, I can't teach you everything there is to know about assembly in 20 minutes, and I'm not going to try. But I think a lot of programmers are intimidated by assembly. And so I want to show you the basics. I want to get you ready to learn more. And I want to make it so you're not scared of it. I want you to like it a little bit. And I'm also going to show you a few practical tips that can help you as an iOS developer. So, first of all, why learn assembly language? You don't usually need to write this unless you're writing very performance sensitive code or maybe working on really low power embedded microcontrollers. But understanding assembly language can help you with debugging and it can help you with reverse engineering and exploring Apple's frameworks. So let's talk a little bit about what assembly language is. Machine code is the code that runs on the CPU in your device. Machine code is just binary numbers. Assembly language is the closest thing we have to a direct representation of machine code that we can still read. When you compile your program, whether it's Swift, C, Objective C, or C, the compiler outputs a binary executable that is machine code. It's fundamentally just numbers. By disassembling that machine code, we get an assembly language representation. That a human can read and understand with just a little bit of knowledge. Before we get into some of the details, I want to talk about a few vocabulary words. So the first one is register. What is a register? Well, a register is a small individual piece of memory in the CPU. On x86 64, which is what we'll be talking about today, each register can hold an 8 byte or 64 bit value. The specifics of registers, their names, their sizes, what they're used for, that varies depending on which CPU you're on. So it's different for the ARM processor in your iPhone.、Uh, but, but the basics, the idea of what a register is, is the same. Some registers are general purpose, some are dedicated to a particular function, and some have usage that is specified by convention. Registers are directly inside the CPU. And that means that they're really, really fast. But really, you can think of a, a register like a variable in your assembly language program. So on x86 64, there are 16 registers you should know about. They're shown here, they have names,、uh, and we'll talk about what a few of these do as we go on. But let's move on to the next vocabulary word. So that's a mnemonic. Mnemonic is a, a, a simple name for an assembly language instruction that's easy for us to remember. So we use mnemonics to remember and refer to CPU instructions. Let's look at a few mnemonics for, for a few common instructions. So we have here a, a number of instructions. You can see that they each have a three letter mnemonic. Move means move a value from one location to another, from one register to another, 
uh, or from a memory location to another memory location. Add means add two numbers together. Sub is for subtracting two numbers. CMP is short for compare, and that allows you to compare two numbers, which is really a special form of subtraction. JNE is short for jump not equal. This allows you to jump to a different part of your program depending on the result of the last operation, the last comparison. So you can use this to implement something like an if statement. NOP, N-O-P, or NOOP, is just a do nothing operation. And you can use this to introduce intentional delays in a program. Call is what you use to call a function, and we'll talk a lot more about this in a minute. POP pops the stack, and of course there's a corresponding push instruction as well. And RET for return is, does just what a return statement in Swift does. It says, I'm done with this function, go back to where, uh, where the calling code is. So these are mnemonics for some instructions, but in actual assembly language, each line of code will have an instruction followed by zero, one, or two operands. For example, here, the move instruction, move R80x42, means move, or copy, the hex value 42, into register R8. Add R80x01 means add one to the value in R8 and store the result in R8, so that increments R8, and so on. Whenever you see an assembly language instruction, the first thing, the, uh, a line of assembly language, the first thing is the instruction. And then there are actually two different syntaxes. There's Intel syntax and AT&T syntax. We're gonna use Intel syntax in this talk because I think it's a little easier to understand, but they both work. In Intel syntax, the first operand is always the destination of the operation. And the second is always the source. So let's talk about calling convention. What does calling convention mean? Well, let's say we have two functions, a main function and a function that adds two numbers together. When our main function calls the add function, how does it pass in arguments? It puts those arguments in specific registers that the add function knows to look for them in. And similarly, the add function puts its result, the thing it's returning, in a register that the main function knows to look in. So this agreement about which registers are for which arguments and the return value is what we call a calling convention. Calling the specifics of the calling convention depend on the CPU and the platform. On Unix systems running on x86-64 like the iOS simulator or macOS, the standard calling convention is called the System 5 calling convention. Windows uses a different calling convention. But for, for our most common calling convention on x86-64, uh, these are sort of the standard locations for arguments and the return value of a function. So, Argument one goes in RDI, argument two goes in RSI, and so on. The return value goes in RAX. It's actually worth memorizing this list because it's helpful when you're debugging. You might ask, what about a function that takes more than six arguments? Any arguments after uh, the sixth one get passed on the stack. So let's look at an example. We have that same code, the main function that calls an add function and then prints the result. We start on the line where the add function is called. And first, the arguments to this function, two and three, must be placed in the correct registers. According to the calling convention we just talked about, the first argument, two, goes in RDI. And then, of course, the second argument, three, goes in RSI. Now, the add function is called and starts executing. So we move down to this line. In order to do its job, the add function needs to retrieve its arguments. So first, it gets a two from RDI. And then it gets a three from RSI, that's its second argument. It performs its calculation, adds the two numbers together, gets the result five, and puts that in RAX, which is the agreed upon register for the return value of a function. Now, control is returned to the main function the add function has finished its work, main needs to get the result of that call. It knows that it can look for it in RAX. So it does just that. It retrieves a five, stores it in C, and then prints that value. 
Okay, so that's calling convention. Now let's actually dig into some assembly language. We'll take a, that same very simple function that takes two arguments, adds them together and returns the result. We're writing this in C, but in Swift it would look very similar. If we compile this function, we get some assembly language that looks like this. As a note, for those of you that have sharp eyes, this is unoptimized assembly. It would look different if we optimized it. But one line of code in that function became nine line, lines of code in assembly language. And it might look kind of intimidating, but if we break it down line by line, we can understand what's going on. So let's dive in. We'll actually start with the first two lines. This is what's called the function prolog. The function prolog sets up some things so that the body of the function has what it needs to execute. And what's happening here is the stack is actually being set up. We don't actually care that much about that, so we can skip it. The next thing that happens is that the function needs to get its arguments from the appropriate registers. So we have two move instructions. The move instruction on line two gets the value of RDI and puts it, in, uh, puts it on the stack at a predetermined location. It also, the, the, the next line, line three, gets the value of RSI, so that's the second argument, and puts it on the stack as well. So we now have variable A on the stack at RBP minus eight, that's just an offset into the stack. It's just the location in memory, fundamentally. And we have argument B, the second argument, at RBP minus 16. Again, just the location in memory. Next, we move argument A from its location on the stack into the RSI register. And finally, we actually perform the addition. So we use an add instruction to add the value at RBP minus 16, which is B, to the value in RSI, which because of the last instruction is A. And, store, and that, then the result of that addition is also stored in RSI. So we now have our result. We need to put the result, five, in the correct location for the calling code to find it. So we move the value of RSI, again, this is our result, into RAX, which is the return register by our calling convention. Finally, we pop the stack to restore it, and we return from the function we return back to whatever code called this function. Okay, so we saw a very simple function in assembly. But let's talk about how you can use assembly to actually help you as an iOS developer. It most often comes up in debugging. I think all of us have had the experience where we experience a crash or some error in our iOS app and the debugger stops and we see a big long list of assembly in the, in the debugger and I look at that and I think, I have no idea what this means. But with just a little bit of knowledge of, of assembly, you can actually find some useful information. So the first thing that it's nice to know is that in LLDB, the debugger in Xcode, if you're in Objective-C mode, you can do PO and then dollar sign and then the name of the register. So if we want to print the value that is in RDI, we can just do PO dollar RDI. Let's look at an ex a, a, a slightly more complicated example. So let's say we want to break whenever the touches began method is called on any object, on any UI responder. We're trying to debug touch handling in our app, see why something's not getting a touch or a touch is in the wrong place. So we set a breakpoint on UI responder touches began with event. We can do that with the B command in LLDB, passing the Objective C method we want to break on. That's great, so we've set a breakpoint. Now, when our program stops because the breakpoint is hit, we kind of want to know something about why this happened. And maybe the first thing we want to know is which object had, it, had this method called on it. Well, we can figure that out because we know a little bit about assembly language and registers and calling convention. Because this is Objective-C or dynamically dispatched Swift, Objective-C dispatch Swift, the function being called is actually Objective-C message send. And the first argument to Objective-C message send is always the receiver of the message. 
So we can print out the RDI register. Remember, that's the register for argument one to find out which object this method is being called on. So if we do PO dollar RDI, we see when I created this example that my tap was on a UI table view cell content view. It was on a row in a table view. And I can see exactly which object that was and its frame and anything else I want to know about it. Incidentally, if you print the second argument, so that's RSI, you get the selector. You get the method that is being called. And that's because the second argument to Objective-C message send is always the selector. But maybe the most interesting thing, thing here is the third argument. If we want to see the touch object that triggered this method, we actually need to look at the, the third object. Even though it's the first, uh, first argument to the, to the touches began method, because the receiver and the selector take up arguments one and two, the first argument to a method is actually the third argument to Objective-C message send. So we can print RDX, which is the register where the third argument to a function is stored, and see that, see that UI touch uh, object that actually triggered uh, this method being called. And we can see where it was and all that other stuff we might want to know about that touch in our debugging. So I want to give you a swift hint. You've probably noticed that the examples so far have been C and Objective-C. We're at a swift conference. The bad news is that it, when LLDB is in swift mode, it doesn't actually let you directly print uh, registers by their name. But you can use, uh, you can, you can use LLDB in, the, in Objective-C mode to do that, even if you are in a swift program. And you can use this command to create an alias I, I use CPO for Objective C print object. So I can just do CPO dollar RSI and have it work, even if I'm in Swift mode in the debugger. So you can stick this in your LLDB init file, and you'll have this new command, CPO, that will work to print registers even in Swift mode. And uh, I find that pretty useful. There's one more thing I want to talk about. We don't have time to dig too deep, but there's a tool that's pretty useful for disassembling Mac and iOS binaries and understanding how they work. It knows about Swift, it knows about Objective-C, and it can even create C and Objective-C-like pseudocode to help you understand what assembly is doing. If you're doing reverse engineering or disassembly, or you want to be able to dig in and understand how Apple's UI kit methods are actually implemented, Hopper is an invaluable tool. It's not free, but it's worth the money uh, if it's going to save you time or enable you to be a better iOS developer. I think it's also a pretty good tool for learning assembly. If you'd like to learn more, more than I could cover in 20 minutes, here are some resources. RayWenderlich.com uh, has a good tutorial on assembly language. They also have a book called uh, Reverse Engineering, some advanced, advanced debugging and reverse engineering um, that uh, covers all of this stuff and more and is, is really well written. It's worth reading. Um, there's a tutorial here for the NASM assembler, which is not iOS specific, not Apple platform specific, but it's a really good tutorial on how assembly language works and how you can actually write and run assembly language programs. Mike Ash, one of my favorite bloggers, has a blog on assembly language that's great. And then there's a link to Hopper. If you want to get in touch with me, I'm on Twitter, at AR Madsen. You can email me. I have a blog. Uh, and I am happy to hear from people with questions. Or uh, if you've learned something that I would benefit from knowing, I always like learning new things. And I will leave this up. You can scan this QR code to get these slides, those resource links, and my contact info if you're interested. <coughs> That's all. I hope you have a new appreciation for assembly and uh, some enthusiasm to go out and learn more about it and become a better iOS developer. Thank you.